Okay, Natasha, are you here now? Can can you can you connect? Yes, sir. Okay. Yeah, no, we have, it's actually bad. This semester only had a couple computer glitches. Actually, this is not terrible. Uh you want to go, Natasha, give me the facts in our first case, uh, Hannon? Sure. So in Hannon, um Hannon enters into a lease with Dutch. Yeah, I say Dutch. I I don't want to say it the other way. Go ahead. Dutch is good. Um and <laughs> The duration of the lease is 15 years, starting on January 1st. And then um, the plaintiff alleges that Dush failed to put him in possession of the property on the date when he was supposed to, because when he got there, he saw that the previous tenants were still occupying. Good. Um, and then the defendant refused to evict the tenants, the holdover. Good. And so he brought a suit against him, and he claimed that uh, he had a duty to deliver actual possession, not just legal possession of the property, um, even though there was no express covenant in the lease hmm. that would guarantee that. Okay, really good, really good. Um, Natasha, one more question for you, then you're off the hook. What's a covenant? Um, I would say like an agreement. Yeah, that's good. And, and what's an express covenant? I'm sorry, I gave you two questions, I said one. What's an express covenant? I would assume that it's in the writing of the lease. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Okay, thank you so much, Natasha. In property two, which you will take, I guess, either the summer or in the fall, you'll have an entire unit what's called covenants. Um, a covenant's a promise, right? That, that That's all it means. Remember, like, the Ark of the Covenant, like, you know, Indiana Jones, right? Um, a covenant is a... No, no, it's Ray of the Lost Ark, but it's the Ark of the Covenant. Uh, a covenant's a promise. Um, a promise to do something. If you are signing a lease, you can reach a written agreement and express covenant to do or not do certain things. So for example, you could have a covenant that says, um, I, the landlord, promise that on January 1st, Black Acre will be empty. There'll be no one else there but you. You can do that, right? Uh, you can have a covenant that says, if on January 1st, there's a holdover tenant, I, the landlord, promise to expel the tenant. You can do that. Right? There's nothing stopping you from doing that. And often when you negotiate covenants, it raises the price. Right? The more the landlord promises to do, the more the landlord promises to do, the more expensive the property is going to be. Because you know, you're taking more responsibilities and there's a risk, right? If I'm the landlord and I promise to expel the holdover tenant and he's actually holding over, I have to pay money. I have to go hire uh uh a lawyer to file notice of eviction. I have to go hire a process server to give them service a process, right? There's costs involved. So you're allowed to negotiate express covenants. But Natasha is uh, uh, correct in this case. Um, there are no express covenants, right? There are no express covenants. All right. So then the question becomes, is there an implied covenant? An implied covenant to give the tenant physical access. Uh, Paul, are you here today? No, he emailed me uh, before. That's right. I said, I'm getting, by the way, I'm getting so many emails from students with vaccines, which makes me very happy. Uh, but I, I can't keep them all straight in my head who, who emailed me for which one. Um, Asriel, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Okay. So let me let me give you the same question I was going to give to, to Paul a minute ago. Um, what's an implied what's an implied covenant? Help us out there. So an implied covenant would be you just assume that once you get there, nobody's going to be living there, um, walking near a park, that nobody's going to be or nobody's going to be uh, having possession over it. Okay. How how are it, how is an implied covenant created? Um, it's just the law of the land. So in this case, the court um, was deciding to use whether the, the either the English. Oh no! Don't don't go there. Almost not there. Okay. Just in general, how how in a contract in a lease, how is a term implied? It's just supposed to be understood by both parties. Um, interpreted by both parties to mean a certain thing. Okay, so let's just let's try it in a different way. Express means in writing. That is, the parties write out a term, they sign it, right? Mm -hmm. 
Is an implied agreement written? No. Is it like inserted into their contract? They like they never write they scribble spoken, in the margins. Never. No. Never spoken. Never written. So how do you know it's there? By what by what force is it in a contract or a lease if it's not actually written? How, what does what it mean for something to be implied? Like, remember the implied warranty of uh, mercantility? Remember that from contracts? Does that sound familiar? We'll do in property next week the implied warranty of habitability. What's What does implied mean? Who's Im Azrael, let me try it differently. Who's implying it? So let's speak the least lessor is implying to. No, he said nothing. He didn't imply anything. He didn't infer, didn't imply the nothing. Least, the Who least is understanding that the lessor will have the property open for them. No, not exactly. Aaron, you there? Aaron? Uh, I think your camera's off and you, your, your, your mic's off. Okay, I'll skip you. Uh, Emily. Classroom, professor. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. Okay, uh, I, I apologize. My When I exited Zoom, my, my thing, uh, my, my, oh my, I'm all disheveled. I have everything set up perfectly, then it goes away. Okay, Aaron, you there? Yeah. Who implies the covenant or how is it implied? A lessee by. Uh, it's not the lessee implying it. It's not the lessor implying it. Who's who actually implies it, or what implies it? It's a very simple answer. Mm. Oh, someone's holding the fan up in the first row of the classroom. I can't see who it is. That who is that? Derek. Derek. Who's implying it? Wouldn't it be the court implies? Yes. Yes. You know, this is the first time calling a student raising their hand all year, I think. Very good. I, I feel like I'm, I'm a normal you know, professor again. You're exactly right, Derek. Say it one more time. The court. The court. Is it the covenant? That's right. And it's precise. It's actually the state, but the court, I think, is actually the better answer, right? The court's saying that we find as a matter of law that this term is so important that every contract should have it, right? It's not required to write the implied warranty of mercantility. You don't have to write it in. The court will write it in for you. So the parties simply assume it's there. I mean, someone said assume, which is not wrong. That that's that's correct. It was Azrael. That's not wrong. But the implication is being done by the government, by the court. And the court says that every lease must have this term. So that's the question in this case. Will the courts imply, right? Right? Will the courts imply? Um, terms that the parties do not expressly write down on paper? Will the courts imply a term that the that the parties don't write down and sign to, right? It's almost like an exception to the statute of frauds, right? Usually you are only bound by the terms you, you agree to in writing. But the exception to that is the court can apply a term that you didn't agree to in writing. All right, everyone with me. All right, uh, Emily, are you here? Emily? Yes, I'm here. So Emily, in this case, there are these two sort of competing rules to decide whether uh, a term will be implied, right? There's the, um, there's the English rule, and then there's the American rule. Um, help us out. What is the what is the English rule? Um, the English rule is that there's an implied that there's an implied covenant that requires the lessor to put the lessee into possession into actual possession. Oh, good. Use the right word. Yeah, good. You, you, you anticipate my question. Actual possession. So, practically speaking, what does that mean to to have an implied term to put them in actual possession? What does that mean? Um. From my understanding, it means that the lessor, the lessor has a uh, has a responsibility to make sure that the property is actually physically empty and ready to be inhabited by the new tenant and clear of the old, um, and that the old tenant has vacated the premises. Good, good. I think you said a few things that are correct. I just want to repeat them, right? So number one, and I'll just say landlord tenant because it's easier than lessor lessee. Make, make, make life easier. The landlord has the duty to um, make the premises available, right? Physical, 
actual possession. It has to be physically available. There are no obstructions, right? The doors aren't locked. Um, you know, you can imagine there's not like, you know, uh, some sort of, uh, some sort of physical condition that blocks you from entering. You know, imagine it's like a mudslide, right? I'm, I'm trying to think of a crazy example, a mudslide, and you can't walk through the front door, right? That would not be physical possession because you can't physically enter the premise. All right. If there's a padlock on the door, okay, that doesn't work because you you can't physically enter the premise, right? So that's number one. Um, but number two, if there's a holdover, tenant, a tenancy at sufferance, you will move to evict. The landlord moves to oust the old tenant. It's not the obligation of the new tenant coming in to have to go file an eviction action, right? And, and I think I think most people would agree that forget common law for a minute. The English rule does make some sense, right? Uh, Angelina, are you here? Angelina, yes. why does the Angelina? Why does the English rule? you know, sort of makes sense, putting aside the, what the court does here. Why does it make, <laughs> excuse me, make some sense? Um, well, it makes sense because um, they are not holding, um, like they're, they're kind of having them be more accountable. Well, well, who, generally when you first move into an apartment or, or a house or something, do you have any clue who might be holding over? Is there any way you would even know that? Not until you go in on the first Okay, day. now you're the landlord, right? And you know that you have a tenant coming in on January 1st. And on December 31st, you see a guy still there. And he hasn't moved. He hasn't hired a moving truck. He hasn't. He's just sitting there, right? December 31st. Maybe you know something's up? Yeah, I would, I would definitely think something's up. Which party is in the best position or has the least cost to figure out that there's a possible eviction? Um, that would be, are you saying like between the English rule and the American rule? Uh, just under, yeah, uh, under the English rule, which party has the, is in a better position to perhaps oust a holdover tenant? Uh, the landlord. Oh, absolutely. Right. The landlord, cause he's there. He knows, you know, maybe he finds out that the tenant says, you know what? I'm not leaving January 1st. I'm going to stick around, whatever. Right? right. In that case, he could take the appropriate action to oust the tenant on January 1st. But now when you're the tenant, you come in, it's like, who the hell is this guy? I have to go hire a lawyer now, right? Angelina, one last question. Would the tenant in this case have, have signed the lease if he knew there'd be a holdover? Um, no. Probably not. Probably not. Maybe, you know, he wouldn't care. It's a 15-year lease. You know, it's a long term. But it's a good chance he would not have signed the lease had he known. And I think that's what the, the English rule does. Um, th thank you, Angelina. This is one of those weird cases where the English rule is actually more generous in the American rule. Usually the English rule is kind of strict and the American rule is a little bit more lenient. But here the English rule is actually more generous and the American rule is a tough one. Um, so let's go on to, uh, yeah, uh, hold on, yeah, Derek, I see your hands up. Go ahead, Derek. Yeah. Okay. So I think I think it's a little little muffled, but I think I think I heard the question. It's does the um, does the obligation go beyond the day he's supposed to take possession? Right. So that's one of the weird things of the rule. That's why let's say the lease begins January first and everything's cool, and then January second holdover comes back. Right. At that point, you call the police to evict the person, or you engage in self help, I suppose. Right. It's a very strange rule that it only applies the day the lease begins. Because if it's a minute later and the new tenant's in possession, then you call the police and you go through the no normal channels. But, but yes, I think, I think your reading is correct. Thank you. Um, so that's the English rule, right? Uh, is Angelina, Alec, you here? Yes, sir. Okay, help me out here. What's the American rule? The American rule essentially says that the landlord has no duty to deliver actual possession. So if you move in and discover that a holdover is there, uh, essentially, they're just committing a trespass, and a landlord should not be held responsible for any trespass that their their old tenants commit. So, yeah, bring a civil suit against the, the trespasser. Good, Derek. Let me ask you as a general matter: Are you responsible for someone else's torts? No. That's a really basic rule, right? If you commit a tort, you know, I'm not responsible unless it's like some sort of relationship, like responding at superior or something, right? I'm not liable for your torts. 
Why should the landlord be responsible for a trespassing tenant? Uh, I mean, in this case, they, I think under the American rule, they, they wouldn't be. They're, they're, you know, right, no, but th that's why you adopt the American rule. But what's the sort of the legal rationale of why we shouldn't force a landlord to account for his holdover tenant? Uh, I think really the only justification would be that he signed a new lease. And that lease would, I mean, if you, if you have an implied, that implied, uh, you know, delivery back to possession, you would need to do that. It's basically a contractual obligation that you have. Good, to good, 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 good. Good, 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 yeah. Yeah, so the, the rationale behind, thank you, Alec. The rationale behind the American rule is that if this was so important, right, this idea of physical acts was so important, then sign a covenant. Reach an express deal. Don't force you to put it in because you are now putting costs onto the landlord. You're putting a burden on the landlord, which he did not agree to. Okay. Everyone get the American rule. Now, I think we can all agree that this is a pretty harsh rule um, in that when you sign a lease for moving in January 1st, you don't think you have to negotiate a separate covenant, right? It's like, of course, right? Of course I'm going to have access to it on January 1st. Who would even think that's even possible? Um, I, I The closest I've had this happen, and this happened once maybe five or six years ago, where I checked into a hotel. It was in D.C. Um, and I checked into a hotel, and I'm in the bathroom I'm taking a shower or something, and I hear the door open. I'm like, oh, it must be housekeeping. And then the... <laughs> the front desk had inadvertently given someone else the keys to my room. They screwed up. And so someone else all, yeah, I know. Um, and then someone else was like walking in, like, what the hell are you doing in my, in my room? Like, uh, I was in the bathroom, like, this is my room. And then, you know, it was awkward, right? Um, it happened, right? It was at, it was at the Grand Hyatt near, uh, near Georgetown. So you know where it is. Um, and then eventually the person went to the front desk and, um, you know, they gave this person a different room and, you know, whatever it, it, it resolved itself in a, in a few moments, but there was a, there was a brief moment where a person was like, what are you doing in my room? Cause I don't know if it was a he or she, I didn't even see the person, but I'll say he, he was panicking saying, oh my God, someone's in my room. He thought like I was a trespasser. And then like, I thought he was a trespasser. Right. And you can imagine that with these holdover issues, it may not be clear. Right. Let's say the holdover tenant thought he had permission to stay. Right. Let's say the holdover thought he was a tenant, he had sufferance, and he had a month to month. And then the new guy comes, like, "What do you mean? You're trespassing." So there's actually a legal question of, "Are you trespassing?" It's not always clear if a holdover tenant's trespassing. This might be a sufferance, and that's something a court can figure out. And that's really a case that the landlord should be involved in. Because then there would be an issue of fact. Did the landlord actually give? Um, <laughs> did the landlord actually give a month to month or tenancy at will? Or do you say you have to leave at a certain date? And those are the issues. Uh, Zach says eventually it was maybe 20, 30 seconds. It wasn't very long, but it was very. Oh, yeah, like, it, it, it was. It was. It, 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 no, I mean, it, it maybe it was a minute, but it was under. I mean, thirty seconds. Maybe it felt forever. Because I'm like, I had just checked in. I remember I was in the shower, and I hear the door open. What the hell? And then, like, and it was the shower's running. I can't really hear anything. And then, eventually, the person left, and the front desk apologized. But it was, it was weird. I'd never had that happen before, um, where they just gave someone else the same key to my, you know, the same. They assigned the same room to someone else. Yeah, that's the closest I ever had. I've never had an issue where I tried to move into an apartment and the, the other tenants still there. That it, I mean, it could, it could, it could get violent. I think someone, Derek, said self help, right? A use of force. Look, people, uh, how do I put this nicely, can act irrationally and they can turn to violence very quickly. You can imagine if I'd say, you know, I just got out of the shower and it could have been much weirder, right? So thankfully the door was closed, it was locked, you know, anyway, whatever. All right, any questions? Okay, all right, we'll move on. Um, I know you're all dead to know. Texas has the American rule. Uh, <laughs> I, and I, just, I know someone always asks me that, and so I just, there it is. Texas is the American rule. Um, but it doesn't really matter because every lease you sign nowadays has an express covenant of, of possession. 
right? Um, you'll you'll see, you know, the if you ever sign a lease, there's basically a standard lease from the Texas Real Estate Commission. Everyone signs the same lease. It's pretty standardized. And this lease includes a, a right of actual possession. So it doesn't matter we have the American rule because there's, there's never been an issue without it. Okay. All right. Questions? All right. Let's move on. Okay. Um, the next topic is one where people think they're using terms correctly, but they're not. And that's the topic of assignment. Sorry, certainly I. That's the topic of assignments versus subleases. Um, many of you have probably engaged in what you thought was actually a sublease that was probably an assignment. And people use these terms um, incorrectly on a consistent basis. So let's try um, questions. And I think you should still have the link to the, the class notes. Those. Those are still there. Oh, by the way, if, if your Google Docs isn't formatting correctly, turn off ad blocker on Google Docs. I had this crisis last night, um, uh, and it was really bad, uh, where Google Docs was not loading at all. Oh, is Google is, – is the iClicker signing you out? Are you signed out? Oh. All right. I'm going to start iClicker again. Please be sure to sign to the attendance. Um, I'll, I'll fix it later, but just make sure you sign to the attendance again, and I think everything will be fine. Okay. And let me start a poll. I, I think when I rebooted it, it, it reset the thing. All right, so let's look at question 2A, right? And question 2A is trying to see if you can tell the difference between an assignment and a sublease. So here's question number uh, – actually, I'm sorry, question 3A. We'll skip question 2. Okay, question 3A. Larry, the landlord, leases Blackacre to Tom, the tenant, for two years. Tom conveys an interest in Blackacre to Sam for one year. What does Sam have? An assignment or a sublease? Something in my eyes. This is not, this is not my day, guys. All right, uh, ba, ba, ba. Tyler, I think you're in the classroom, right? Yeah, there you are. Okay. All right, help us out here, Tyler. What's your answer? Uh, I think uh, I think assignment, but I'm pretty sure that's incorrect. <laughs> what well, assignment would be an assignment of the entire lease, whereas a sublease is a portion of the lease period. Okay. Good. All right. Um, so what's your final answer? Sublease. Okay. That's right, B. The answer here is B, and let me explain why. Um, we have two types of conveyances here. There's an assignment, there's a sublease, okay? <clears throat> People will use these terms sort of interchangeably, but they have very different meanings. With a sublease, you have a tenant who's granting part of his interest to a third party, right? You have a tenant who's granting part of his interest to a third party. So in this question we have, Tom has a two-year lease, and it conveys one year of that lease to Sam. Tyler, what happens after that one year uh, runs out? It, it goes back to Tom for the remaining year. What do you call Tom's interest? A remainder? No, 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 it's not a remainder. What do you call the future interest after a natural termination that goes back to the grand tour? Oh, a reversion. There it is. You see it? Yeah, because Tom was the grand tour. There it is. You hate me, don't you? Remainder, no, reversion. Sense. I'm sorry? It makes sense. Both Larry and Tom are grand tours. Aren't they? They are. Yeah. Thank you. I'm glad you got that, Tyler. Very good. I know you hate me, but no matter what I ask you, you have to remember your future interests. It, it, it like it like infects every aspect of the semester. I'm sorry, but it's true. Tom gave the lease or gave the sublease to Sam for one year, and after that one year, there's reversionary interest. It goes back to uh, Tom to Tom's reversion. 
And we know it's one year because it's fixed term. It's a natural termination. There's no doubt after one year it goes back to them. Okay. So when you see a lease and the person with the lease gives part of his interest to a third party, we're dealing with a sublease. Now with a sublease, right? With a sublease, um, uh, that was Tyler. Hey, Willie, are you here? Willie? No, no, Willie. Uh, Zach, I know you're here. Yeah, yeah. So, Zach, with a sublease, is there any relationship form between uh, ta uh, between Larry and Sam in this question? Is there any relationship between Larry and Sam? Um, yes. Are Larry and Sam in privity? Yes. I don't think Larry can destroy Sam's land. Uh, I'm asking a different question. Who has the obligation to pay the rent in question uh, uh, 2A? The, the original the original grantor. Not grantor. No, well, the, the original grantor. just use your names. That's why I put names here. In this, in this uh, question, we have Larry, Tom, and Sam. Who has the obligation Tom, to pay the rent? Tom has to pay the rent to Larry. Right. What happens if Sam doesn't pay up rent? Who's on the Tom hook? Still, Tom still has to pay. Okay. Is Larry in privity with Sam? I want to say yes because Sam can't destroy the land. But forget forget about destroying. Know. I'm just talking a payment of rent. Let's just make it easier. Okay. Uh, no, he's not. that's that's more or less the answer, right? There's no real relationship created between Larry and Sam. The relationship remains between Larry and Tom with the sublease, right? So many of you have probably thought you were doing sublease and you thought, oh, this is great. I'm getting out of my lease. Yeah, not exactly, right? If you sublet your apartment to Sam, for example, and Sam decides to not pay his rent, guess what? The landlord's coming after you, coming after Tom. And to, to Zach's point about destruction of property, that's also a fair point. If you sublet, sublet your apartment to someone and they wreck the apartment, guess what? The landlord's coming after you to fix it, which is why the landlord makes both Tom and Sam signed the sublease agreement, right? To make sure it's clear that Tom is still on the hook, right? So there is a relationship between Larry and Sam. There is some kind of relationship. I don't want to get into the details, but the important part is the primary linkage is between Larry and Tom. Okay. With the so, sublease. So there is a relationship. It's just a little more tenuous. Yeah, so right. Okay. Generally, the the this what's called the sublessee, Sam, right? S. Sublessee will pay out to uh, the landlord. But if he doesn't, they go after Sam or Tom. Okay. Gotcha. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Zach. Everyone with me so far? All right. Question 3B then should be pretty easy because it's process elimination. Um, Larry leases Black Acre to Tom for two years. Tom conveys an interest in Black Acre to Sam for two years. What does Sam have? Okay. Uh, that was Zach. Uh, Catherine here. Catherine R. No. Uh, Pierce. No oh, Pierce. Tenants is not so hot today. Brian? Uh, yes, I'm here. Okay, what's your answer, Brian? I put A. Okay, what's an assignment? Uh, like complete transfer of the interest in them. How do you know there's a complete transfer here? Well, because it's two years. The lease is two years, and he gave it to. What's his name? The other guy for two years. Is there any reversionary interest here? Yeah, to a grant for or Larry. Does Tom have any reversionary interest here? No. What? How do you know that? Because the lease itself ends. 
at the same time that it would have ended. Right. So, oh, excellent. Let me clarify the question. Does Larry have reversionary interest? Yes. But does Tom have reversionary interest? Oh, actually, maybe. Yeah. No, not at all. What happens after two years? What happens to Black Acre? It goes back to Larry. So does Larry have reversionary interest? Yes. Okay. Does Tom have any reversionary interest? No. Okay. That's right. Okay. Thank you, Brian. That's right. Okay. The answer is A. Almost all of you got this one right. Very good. And Zach, I see your hand. I'll get to you in a second. Um, these facts are consistent with the assignment where Tom gave his entire interest to Sam. Tom has nothing left over. If you want to think of it like the bundle of sticks, Tom gave his entire bundle of sticks to Sam. Every stick in the bundle. There's nothing left. There's no reversion. Right? There's no reversion from left over. Tom gave his entire bundle of sticks to Sam. Sam would therefore have an assignment. And this assignment creates a direct linkage between Larry and Sam. Tom is out of the picture. Tom has no sticks left in the bundle. If there's a failure to pay rent, Sam is on the hook to Larry. If there's damage to the apartment, Sam is on the hook to Larry. Tom is gone, right? When a landlord approves an assignment, he's basically saying to the current tenant, I am releasing you of all claims. You are now on your own, right? For that reason, landlords don't like assignments. Landlords much prefer subleases. Why? There's more people to sue, right? It's, it's you get two bites of the apple. Maybe you get the money from Tom, maybe you get it from Sam. But when you give an assignment, Tom's out of the picture. You'll only go after Sam. Okay, Zach, what's your question still up? Um, you, what, I think you answered it. Um, Good. If, if, if Sam breaks after one year, he's now liable, not Tom. Say it one more time. I think I lost you in the middle. So if Sam breaks the assignment after one year. Uh, well, he breaches the lease. He breaches the lease. You don't really break yeah. the assignment, right? You breach the lease, right? Breaches the lease. Sam is the one that's liable now instead of Tom. Okay. Correct. All right, everyone with me? All right, so again, people don't use the term assignment and sublease correctly. They sometimes use the words sort of interchangeably, and there's a huge difference. Landlords much prefer a sublease. Tenants much prefer an assignment. Um, now, almost every lease that you'll ever sign says any assignment or sublease must be in writing, approved by the landlord, right? I'm sure if you look at your lease, it's in there, I promise. Um, because landlords don't want you just saying swapping. Oh yeah, here's Bill. He's going to be your new tenant. And who the hell's Bill? Right? Does he have credit? Does you know he have a criminal history? Who, who is this guy? We didn't we didn't vet him. Um, so so you always have to have some sort of assignment in writing that that's going to be in every case. Okay. All right. Let's do the next case from Tennessee. Um, this is another case where people try to write their own. Uh, property conveyances and the processes are screwed up and they didn't write things the way they should have. And the court sort of says, all right, we know what they meant. Uh, uh, Bradley, are you here? Yes, sir. Okay. You want to give me the facts uh, in, in uh, uh, Ernst versus Condit from Tennessee, please? Sure. I can do that. Um, so basically the plaintiff in this case or the original uh, lessor of the place, Rogers, leased the property from uh, Walter and Emily Ernest to operate a go-kart track on mm -hmm. it. Um, they execute a lease and everything, and then there's the portions of the lease that are obviously in the book that cover how much he's supposed to pay in terms of rent, and then the that the lessee has no right to assign a lease, a, a sublet or assign lease without prior written approval. Um, after operating for a certain amount of time, uh, Rogers then... Uh, wanted to basically kind of sell the business to uh, Condit. Um, they went over the terms with the owners, Ernest, and uh, kind of uh, modified the contract to say how they could, how the new guy, how um, Condit could take over the lease, basically. Um, there's all the terms that they read from the book and everything. Mm -hmm. And then Condit took over operating. Um, Ernest 
kind of fought back saying that he was supposed to owe a month's rent for something. He didn't say much about it. They continued on with their lease until it was about to terminate where then the condit, uh, where Ernest then came and said that he owed money and he didn't remove uh, his equipment from the property uh, like he was supposed to in terms of the lease. And basically the main issue came down to was that Condit said that it was a sublease and not an assignment, and therefore he didn't have responsibility, and Rogers was actually on the hook. Excellent. Very, very good. Those facts are easy. Good job, Bradley. I appreciate it. Make, make, my, make, my, make my job much easier uh, when the facts are all there. Thank you. Um, so, again, we have a situation here where we have three parties, right? Um, Ernst owns the property. He's a landlord. Ernst gives a lease to Rogers. Uh, it's called a go-kart track, you know, these old zippy cars that go around a loop. Um, Rogers runs a business for some short period of time. Then he decides to sell his business to Condit, right? And Condit wanted a two-year lease. I suppose Condit thought a good business was go-karts. Who knows? Uh, it turns out the business wasn't so good. And Condit basically stopped paying rent and he disappeared. So the question becomes, who does the landlord Ernst go after? Does Ernst go after Rogers, who is the lessee? Or does Ernst go after the third party, Condit? Is Condit a sub lessee or an assignee, right? Those are the two terms we use, right? Sub lessee, remember ending in EE, a sub lessee. Or an assignee, ending again in ee, the suffix. Now the the agreement, I think Bradley gave us the facts quite well, says uh, subletting. Right, the word used in the agreement is subletting. So you might think by the word subletting that um, Roger sublet his interest to Condit. Uh, now, uh, Freddie, are you here? Yes, I'm here. So, Freddie, let me ask you a question, please. If Rogers gave a sublease to Condit, is there any relationship between Ernst, the landlord, and Condit? If he sublet? If there's a sublet, yes. Um, no. No. So if there's a failure to pay rent, who does the landlord go after? Rogers. Correct. Is Rogers in the picture? Do we even know where he is? Is he in the picture? Yeah. Do we, does Rogers even involved in this case at all? Um, no, he isn't. We don't know where he is, right? It's just it's sort of unclear, right? Um, thank you, Freddie. So we have the situation where if there was a sublease, you go after Rogers. But Rogers, is, we have no idea where he is. And the landlord wants to go after the current or the most recent tenant. If there's an assignment, though, a relationship is formed between Ernst, the landlord, and um, Condit, the, the assignee, right? In which case, Condit would be the hook for the lease. All right, uh, Catherine, you here? Yes. Okay, Catherine, help us out. How does the court interpret this lease? So they interpret it under um, the general rule, which is saying that if he conveyed the entire term and left no interest, basically it's not going back to him at the end of the term, then it'll be an assignment. And otherwise it's a sublease essentially saying that if um, Rogers could come back and take over the go-kart business, then it'd be a sublease. Okay, good. And one more question, Catherine, why does the court sort of ignore the language used in the agreement? The language says sublease. Why do they kind of, uh, why do they ignore that language? Um, it seems like even though they say sublease, they're clearly giving the entire term. Good. How do you know that? How do you know they're giving the entire bundle of sticks? Because in the lease, it's extending the two years and it's ending with content. There's no time left over. Excellent. Right. I mean, that's th th very good, Captain. That's like the question I gave you was a 3B, where they give the entire two year to the lease. I was kind of thinking of this, this case. The courts have what we might call a functional analysis. They're not so much concerned with the words that were chosen 
Instead, the court is looking to the effect of the lease, right? What, what does it actually do? And here, Rogers gave to Condit the entire bundle of sticks. Well, however many days from the lease, he got every single day. There's no reversionary interest. Rogers did not retain any reversion, right? He gave the entire interest to uh, Condit. Um, Condit remained in possession. Rogers had no reservation of interest. Rogers did not have any reversionary interest, nothing. Um, the use of the word sublet basically doesn't matter. So what this case teaches you is that the words used are probably less important than the actual decision. Uh, and very often people use the word sublease incorrectly when they actually mean assignment. Um, also with commercial leases, I think it's easier to find an assignment. Uh, for residential, I think they might err on the side of a sublease, but um, you know, you go away for the summer, right? You, 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 you get something back when you're when, when the summer is over. But for commercial, you're giving your entire business, it, it's probably more like this uh, assignment. Okay. Questions, everybody, on the uh, Conda case? Yeah, Bradley, go ahead. So afterwards, it talks a lot about the privity of contract. I don't want you to get bogged down in this because I find that section to be really confusing and not worth it. Okay, just wondering. Uh, I, I've tried teaching in the past, and I found it to be so frustrating, I just stopped. The different types of privy, the privy of estate, privy of contract, and the courts aren't even clear which is which, so I, just don't worry about it. I have, If you look at my notes, it says skip in big letters with exclamation point in my notes, so that, that's what it says, a skip. All right, thank you, Bradley. Other questions on the conduct case? Yeah, Zach, go ahead. Um, I had two questions. I had one of them was the same question as what I had. Um, the second question is here the courts use that functional analysis, like you said, even though the word sublease is used in there. So if we encounter that problem, how are we supposed to weigh these different factors versus the word itself? I think following this case, you would look at the effect and not the wording. I don't think the wording to be dispositive because this was dry, this was this was an instrument drawn by non-lawyers. Um, and very often we have cases. Remember the case where the woman said, I want to give my entire house that cannot be sold and shouldn't align it twice. They basically ignored what she wrote. You, you find that courts very often in property law ignore what people write and try and figure out what they actually meant. So when you have non-lawyers, the courts often look past the word. So that, that's how I would tell you to approach it. But I think the key point here, it was a two-year lease, whatever, and they gave all two years. There's no reversionary interest. And when there's no reversionary interest, there's got to be some kind of assignment. I mean, think of it this way, right? Let's say, like, you know, you, you have a one-year lease and, you know, you travel abroad for the fall semester. You're coming back in the spring, right? You have reversion. You're just giving away for the fall semester. That's going to be a sublease. There's no question about it. But if you're never coming back, that, that sort of resembles more of an assignment. Okay? Thanks, sir. My pleasure. All right. Any other questions, guys, on um, on Ernst? All right. Uh, let's move on. Um, our last case. Um, our last case is from California. And I think I've, you know, said this to you before. Um, any case you have from California is going to reverse the common law. <laughs> uh, that's just like, I've, I've been using this book now for almost a decade. I think almost every California case reverses the common law rule. You just you just have to remember which common law rule is being reversed. That's how you remember the case, if it's California. Uh, Ashley W., are you here? Yes, but my Zoom's frozen, so I was going to talk on Jessica's. You're going to talk what? On Jessica's, my Zoom's frozen right now. Oh, someone's next to you. I see. Okay, that's fine. Um, all right, all right, then that's fine. Uh, can you just give us a fax in and Kendall? Yes. So here it's dealing with a commercial lease of the, an airport, and the city of San Jose owns it. Uh huh. And then I guess I kind of the board's appointed it out. So the city owns the property, and they leases it to Perlage, and then Perlage leases or subleases it to Persona, mm -hmm. who then conveys the lease to Bixler, who 
operates a business there, and then he decides to sell his business to Kindle, but the lease provided um, that written consent of the lesser is required. So then Kindle decides to sell per, or sue Persona for the lease. This is actually trippy. I'm seeing you in two different places at once. Because I can see both of your uh, uh, cameras. Okay, thanks. No, that's fine. Um, thank you, thank you, Jessica. That's that's very good. And I appreciate your classmate. Hello. Uh, appreciate your classmate helping out. There we go. All right, thank you. So this is a commercial context. And I think you'll find that as a general matter, um, the courts treat uh, commercial leases differently than residential leases. Um, when you have a residential lease, you know, there's a person you're living with. And I think the courts give more latitude to choosing your tenant when it's a residential lease. Um, but when you have a commercial lease, uh, it's all business. And most businesses don't care who's living there as long as they pay their rent, right? As long as they're paying their rent, they don't care. So I think you have to keep that in the back of your mind. All right. Now, I'm sure all of you have signed leases. And there's a term that says something like, um, all leases must be in writing. Right, you've all seen that, right? Hundred percent. Uh, so all subleases must be in writing. Um, you probably didn't give much thought to what would happen if your landlord didn't want to do the sublease. Because you know, let's say you know you're you're a student, right? You're very responsible. You know, you you always pay your rent on time, and the landlord likes you. And then you come and say, yeah, yeah, you know what? I think I want my fraternity brother to live here in the summer. And, you know, he's always partying and making all this noise and he doesn't have a good credit history and he won't have anyone co-sign with him. The landlord may say, um, yeah, no way, not assigning this apartment. Good luck. Not going to do it. All right. But that's not this case. Here, they want to assign it to another airline business. The landlord really has no good reason to deny it. Right, there's no good reason to deny the subways. It simply just doesn't want to. He's trying to extract a higher rent. To be to be to be honest, right? And so the question becomes: Is there a reasonableness factor? Right. Um, there's no express covenant. Right. The parties could negotiate it for agreement that says um, the landlord must agree to any reasonable sublease or reasonable assignment. You can do that. But the parties did not reach that agreement. It said, it says the landlord has absolute consent. So the issue in this case is one of implied terms, the same as the first case. Will the courts imply a reasonableness term into the sublease provision? Right? It seems absolute on paper, but the courts sort of modify it and put in a, a reasonableness clause. All right, back up to the top of the alphabet. My friend Derek, I know you're in the front row. Uh, did the California court imply a reasonableness term to this lease? So they did. They did. Why? Well, so from what I understand, um, and I was like trying to go through this case, like, like I was going through this case again, uh, but I was getting kind of hung up on the minority justification of it. Uh, yeah, right? Weird, right? Uh, <laughs> and it, I mean, they said that... So they did, but they said that also it, they based it off of a... Con like they, they based the reasonableness off of a contract and that you can basically change the contract um, at any point in time through the lease. So I was kind of confused about that. Okay, so there are a couple things that Derek said that I want to just pick apart, but you made a couple of good points. Thank you. Thank you very much, Derek. Um, so first off, there's a majority rule, right? And the majority rule is a lessor may grant or reject an assignment request or sublease request for any reason at all, right? It's absolute discretion. Um, the parties can, of course, reach a covenant to... Uh, make it reasonableness standard, but that's not the law. Um, California, of course, says we will not follow the majority rule. We are going to follow the minority rule. And the court says something like the majority rule has been under steady attack. 
this is like this is classic California. But say there's this rule that's been applied in most states, but we're not going to follow it because we don't like it. It's not fair. And you'll see this again and again and again and again in California cases. They just ignore the common law rule. They reverse it. Now, why do they go for the sort of minority rule? Why do they say the minority rule is preferable? Um, Derek made a fair point. He says uh, they treat the lease like a contract. Uh, Nicole, I think you're here, right? Yeah, I'm here. Nicole, um, when dealing in contracts, is there always a duty of reasonableness sort of lurking in the background? Yes. Right. You know, can, you know, to give an example, is there like a, 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 when you're engaging in, in, in dealings, if, if a party, you know, you know, wants to engage in an offer and it's reasonable, can you withhold consent generally? Yes. Okay. Oh, that's unreasonable, you said? Yeah, no, no, they make a reasonable request. I mean, is that generally courts will enforce reasonable requests in contracts? Generally? Yes. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Con, con, again, I, I don't like torts, I don't like contracts. There's a lot of reasonableness, which I hate, right? But reasonableness is a sort of background assumption that the courts will require people to engage in sort of good faith negotiations. They're not going to force you to engage in some sort of bad deal. Property historically was a very raw deal. Think of the first case, the American rule case versus the English rule case. That sucked for the tenant, right? The failure to negotiate the right of physical access means he didn't have access to his property. But that was the harsh rule. At common law, property was harsh, very harsh. Contract law is much more uh, pleasant. The modern trend, and I say trend lightly, but the modern trend of property law is to incorporate contract doctrine into real property law, right? You'll see this both in this semester and also next year, where the courts interpret contract provisions and they incorporate contract provisions in property law. This comes up most in landlord tenant. Leaseholds are different than fee simple, right? With fee simple, there's no, there's no duty of good faith and fair dealings, right? That doesn't exist. But what the court says here is we're going to add a duty of good faith and fair dealing to every lease. And basically there's an implied covenant not to harm the other party and to exercise discretion in good faith. Right? They look to the Uniform Commercial Code and they say good faith and reasonableness is the standard. Even though the parties did not negotiate for that standard, they incorporated it in. And then they list all these factors. The, you know, is the person financially responsible? Is it going to be used in a suitable fashion? Is the usage legal? Uh, do they need to alter the premise? Uh, what's the nature of the occupancy? Right? There's still discretion for the landlord to reject this assignment, but the court can decide if that, re if that rejection was reasonable. In other words, the courts can come in and say that you deny the sublease that was reasonable or that was unreasonable. And that's the obligation for the courts to decide. So here they overrule the, the over, they, they reverse the common law rule. Hey, Zach, go ahead. So you're saying that this modern trend is taking these property doctrines, contract doctrines, these contract doctrines and forcing them into the property doctrines, thereby making the property doctrines more flexible. Yes. And to me, that sounds proper for lack of a better word. Which body of uh, government is responsible for changing the rules? The courts, the legislature. In other words, did, did each state adopt the Uniform Commercial Code? I mean, most states uh, have. Yeah, I mean, yeah, most states have. Yeah. Did, did states adopt contract laws for property? Not mm. to the legislature. Right. So the objection, which isn't really in this case, but the objection is, if the legislature wants to put favorable, flexible doctrines into property law, they can do that, but they haven't, right? Every state's adopted some form of the commercial uniform commercial code, right? And some variant, right. right? States have not adopted the restatement third of property. They rejected it almost entirely. Um, so the courts have sort of done it unto themselves to, to bring in this, this sort of modern law without the legislature acting. 
so it's a comedy issue. It's an institution. Uh, I, I would say separation of powers, but but sure. Uh, comedy sounds like, ah, that's funny. Right. But I, I, I would say separation of powers, right? Okay, we, yeah, you, don't, you don't see that criticism in here. That's I know this is Josh's criticism. I'm sorry. I teach con law as well. Uh, no, no, but no. I, I can't, I care very much for which branch of government is changing the law and it should really not be the courts uh, to sort of, you know, rewrite contract, re, re, rewrite property law on the fly. Okay. Thank you, Zach, for that question. So the court here adopts this um, the, the, this modern rule. They reject the common law rule. But then they do something funny, right? They say it's not retroactive, right? It's only prospective, which is usual, unusual because usually the law is always retroactive, right, when you make these sorts of changes. So it's like any lease signed in the past doesn't have these reasonableness clause, but any lease signed in the future does. So this is the way the court's sort of mitigating damages. It's saying, well, we're making this really bold new rule, but only applies going forward. So that minimizes the, the sort of impact. Because you can imagine that you know every single lease signed in the history of the state would now have these terms implied, and that can be significant. Uh, the dissent says it's up to the legislature to change the law, right? Respect the terms the parties reach. Don't rewrite their contract for them. All right. Questions on uh, on um, Pastana. All right. Uh, I have the minute poll running. Let me just wrap up a bit. Um, when we're talking about leases, always keep in mind the difference between the actual possession and legal possession. They're not always the same thing. Uh, moreover, when we're talking about subleases and assignments. The precise language use isn't always dispositive. So sometimes you have to sort of look functionally at what's going on. And uh, at least in California, there's an obligation now to have a reasonableness clause for commercial leases, not for residential leases necessarily. Okay. Any questions? All right. And make sure you do the minute poll and sign in. A lot of you have noticed are doing the polls but not signing into attendance. And that creates problems for me because it says you're absent, but you're not. And I don't always have the time to check on this. So some of your attendance records are screwed up. So make sure every day you sign in and don't make me have to go verify if you were actually were present on the polls. Okay. All right, everybody. Have a wonderful day. I will see you on Monday. Enjoy your weekends. And by the way, I have my shot on Saturday. So it's possible I may have to do something with class. I don't know, but I'm hopefully I'll feel okay. Okay. Bye-bye. Have a good weekend, sir. Thank you too.